So, wildflowers, maybe a little unorthodox topic for November, but I'm sure everyone could use a colorful pick me up going into winter. Uh, so, plants in general, I think, are kind of a little underappreciated, uh, even by nature lovers, even within the conservation community. Uh, most people, obviously, they're more interested in animals. Uh, I knew I was. I didn't even start thinking about plants until I was in high school, and that just was an interest that grew a little over time. I just kind of learned things uh, on my own as the years went by, uh, as I picked up some jobs doing invasive plant control, but uh, I eventually got a job at uh, Shaw Nature Reserve, which is part of the Botanical Garden. Uh, and my job there was one, invasive plant control, but the other half was actually uh, identifying native plants, uh, collecting seed, making these native seed mixes and then trying to actually restore uh, the plant communities of these areas. Uh, and that really kind of brought everything together for me. Uh, I really learned a lot and uh, I had a good appreciation for native plants before, but uh, I'm much more well-rounded now. Uh, so, so as far as wildflowers go, so they're what you'd call herbaceous vegetation. So you can kind of break vegetation anywhere in the world into two basic types. There's the woody vegetation, which is, you know, trees, shrubs, anything made of wood. Uh, and then there's the herbaceous stuff that includes wildflowers. That also includes grasses and sedges, ferns, things like that, non-woody vascular plants. Uh, and these especially are probably the most underappreciated of plants. Uh, most people more tree focused uh, if they like trees. Uh, but what's interesting is that uh, the herbaceous plants are much, much, much more diverse. Uh, even though, say, in a forest, they might be less than 1% of the total plant biomass, uh, they might make up 80% or more of the total number of plant species. Uh, so in Missouri, we have almost 2,000 native plant species, uh, only about 120 or so are, are trees, and most of the rest of those are herbaceous things. And what's kind of cool about that herbaceous layer is uh, things kind of happen a little more quickly. It's a little more dynamic. It's more fragile. So if you get things like floods, uh, if you change the fire regime, so if it's burning more or burning less often, uh, say some trees fall down, there's more grazing, uh, you get very quick responses in that vegetative community uh, at the ground level uh, just because it's more susceptible to those kinds of things like grazing or disturbance by humans. Uh, they also have shorter life cycles. So from one year to the next, it might look pretty different uh, depending on what's going on. Uh, whereas if you're talking about mature trees, uh, it takes quite a long time to see actual changes in the tree community. So uh, things on the ground are often happening much more quickly. Uh, and as I said before, these plants are often much more sensitive. Uh, so most endangered plants are actually herbaceous things like wildflowers. Uh, so because of that, uh, plants, especially wildflowers and herbaceous things, can be really good indicator species. Uh, and plants in general are one of the best and easiest indicators of not only what kind of habitat you're in, but the habitat quality. So if you're trying to do that with animals, uh, I don't know if you've ever tried it before, but finding and sampling animals can take a lot of time. It's very difficult. Uh, plants, you just have to walk around and if you, sure, check my audio. <clears throat> You hear me now? Better? <clears throat> yeah, I think most of us can hear you. Um, but for folks that are having audio issues, I'm going to see if I can find the call in number for that and put that in the chat. Okay. Uh, so, as I was saying, if you kind of know your plants, uh, it's a pretty easy way to know what kind of habitat you're in. So, if you can just you can give a list of plants that are in an area, you can make kind of an educated guess as to the topography of the soils, what's, got, what's going on, how much sun there is. Uh, you can also get kind of a gauge on what kind of history it is. So maybe if you have a lot of conservative plant species, uh, you can kind of guess that that community has been intact for a longer time, it hasn't been disturbed, uh, or maybe it's, it has been disturbed heavily in the past, you're seeing those kinds of plant species. Uh, generally, as far as uh, the overall health of the plant community, the more native plant species that there are, uh, that's generally an indicator of having greater 
uh, ecosystem health. It's more intact, it has more functionality. Uh, there's different species uh, that you can use as indicators of quality. So if you're walking around the woods and you're seeing things like bees, uh, orchids, uh, celandine poppies, uh, Jacob's ladder, often a lot of colorful wildflowers, you can make kind of an educated guess that that plant community, that herbaceous layer, is much more intact. It hasn't changed much over time. It's stayed pretty constant. Uh, it's been stable, healthy, hasn't been degraded as much. Uh, whereas if you're walking around in the woods and um, why is that not working? There we go. Uh, so if you're walking around the woods and all you're seeing is things like uh, black snake root, uh, stinging metal or clear weed, uh, poison ivy, hog peanut, uh, just a lot of those really ruderal plants that will grow anywhere. If they're dominating the entire understory, that might be a sign to you that that area has been degraded in some way. So maybe it was clear cut in the past and farmed and then just regrew in forest over the last few decades. Uh, maybe it had been grazed very heavily. Maybe it's been uh, impacted by invasive plant species. Maybe the tree canopy has gotten too dense, something like that. And it's not always the case that the showy flowers are more conservative species, but it, it often is. <laughs> Is that not working? I think my screen froze. Are you unable to advance? I'll try it again. There we go. Have fun. Right. Uh, so as far as these kind of bottomland communities that we're talking about, stream bottoms, river bottoms, things like that, uh, they really are. They have a distinct plant community from the uplands. You can kind of see uh, the topography difference in that kind of picture here. So on the right, you see kind of these upland hills that had recently been burned. Uh, on the left, you see kind of this floodplain in the Merrimack River drainage at Shaw Nature Reserve. Uh, you kind of see the different things that are forming these ecosystems. So uh, kind of habitats around rivers and streams. Obviously, they're shaped by water, not just by flooding, but also because the water table is higher in these lower elevations. Uh, so water is much more available to the plants that grow there. Uh, therefore, many of them have higher water needs than some of the upland plants. They're not very drought tolerant. Uh, but if you tried to plant some upland plants in these areas, their roots would probably rot. Uh, so soil moisture is one of those things that dictates which plants grow where. Uh, as far as the soils in these riparian sites, uh, they're pretty variable uh, depending on the stream and the topography. Uh, so they can be rocky or gravelly, especially if it's a really high gradient stream, uh, very narrow floodplain. Uh, they might be sandy or they might be very muddy. They have a lot of clay or silt, uh, especially if it's a really slow moving, uh, low gradient stream that floods a lot into a very wide floodplain. Uh, so those different soils can also determine the different kinds of plants growing there. Uh, in general, things like gravel bars or harsher environments, but there are some plants that will grow in them and we'll, we'll talk about a few of them. And then, as I said before, uh, these, these habitats often are prone to flooding. Uh, so you can kind of get a gauge based on the plant community uh, if that habitat is, is flooding a lot, because there are certain plants that will tolerate that better than others, because it is rather stressful for plants. Uh, and these uh, forested riparian areas are often very shaded as well, just because the tree canopy is so dense. So as far as the ecological functions and tenets of herbaceous plants like wildflowers, uh, one, they do kind of help reduce runoff and erosion, just like tree roots, uh, but these plants generally have much finer root systems, uh, generally not, not as bulky as tree roots, but they kind of form much finer mesh, hold the soil together, they're very absorbent. Uh, so they're also absorbing excess rainwater, much like trees are, uh, but they're also covering much more surface area on the ground than just those tree stems are as well. Uh, so not only are they helping absorb that runoff, but they're also creating a lot of uh, roughness and texture to the surface of the ground. So it's slowing rainwater, it's slowing that runoff as it's kind of running off the hills into the bottomlands, into the uh, drainage areas, into the streams. Uh, as it's slowing down, it's 
being better absorbed by the soil. Uh, and these herbaceous plants, they also decompose very quickly because they're usually perennial. They die back every year and they add a lot of organic layer to that soil, which makes it more absorbent. Um, as you see in this picture too, they cover a lot of that, um, most of the ground area if it's relatively healthy. Um, in Missouri, most bottomlands, uh, they can be very heavily uh, covered in uh, wood nettle, like uh, what you see in this picture. Uh, it's, it's like a stinging nettle that's, that's native to the state as uh, sting. It can be pretty dominant in these ecosystems, but even it has functions like the ones I said. Uh, it's also a host plant to uh, red admiral butterflies, a couple other species. Um, you know, uh, the browse species or food species for herbivores this is a jewel weed uh, browsed by a white tailed deer. Um, the ones that have showy flowers, like the ones we're going to talk about soon, obviously they have benefits to pollinators. Uh, many of them also produce large, nutritious seeds, things like uh, birds and rodents will eat over the fall and winter. So now we're actually going to talk about some of the uh, common colorful flowering species that you'd expect to find around Missouri's bottomland areas and stream banks and things like that. I kind of broke it up into the blooming period. So first we're going to start with spring bloomers. Uh, so one of the most conspicuous, well-known, charismatic uh, spring blooming wildflowers in Missouri is Virginia bluebells. Uh, they're a spring ephemeral, so that means they die back uh, every summer after blooming in the spring. Uh, but for a spring ephemeral, they're actually quite robust. I can get a couple feet tall, uh, pretty thick stems. Uh, they're pretty tough plants. Uh, they generally grow uh, good soils, lots of organic material, uh, often in stream banks, big river bottoms, things like that. Uh, they're called bluebells. As you can see, their flowers kind of kind of bell shaped. Uh, they're bright blue, very beautiful plant. Uh, they kind of start out purple, and as those flowers mature, they turn more and more bluish. Uh, so, as far as pollinators go, one of the main pollinators would probably be bumblebees, uh, especially. Uh, Queen bumblebees that are emerging from the ground every spring. So you're going to be using this plant as nourishment to start a new colony. They're also visited by uh, butterflies occasionally as well. Uh, so they can get, they can cover quite a lot of area. Uh, so they spread by rhizomes and they form these huge colonies uh, in intact uh, bottomland areas, usually wooded areas. Uh, they can cover quite a lot of area and they can put on quite a show in, in late March or early April. Sometimes they grow along smaller streams as well. Uh, but generally like rich, rich soils along uh, larger rivers and river bottoms, uh, they, can, they can cover quite a lot of ground. They're one of the dominant plant species in spring. Uh, and they are flood tolerant. So you can see in this picture, uh, these ones popped up and then got brushed over by a flood. Uh, they're pretty tolerant of that, yeah. Uh, they, they generally do best in areas that periodically flood in uh, either late winter or early spring before they flower. And often in these areas over the summer, they go dormant and then they're replaced by uh, stinging wood nettles. Uh, and they are often used in gardens too, especially for shade gardens. Uh, pretty good species to use if you have uh, good soil. A uh, downy yellow violet, it's pretty much just like the purple violets that grow in your yard, except it's yellow. Seems like an oxymoron, but there you go. Uh, it's the only yellow violet species in Missouri. There are a couple other violets, but they're all purple. Uh, its leaves look pretty much just like the violets in your yard. They're very large and heart-shaped. Uh, the flower structure is the same. And they can grow in somewhat large colonies along stream banks or rich, moist hills near rivers. Attractive, dainty little plant. Uh, they are a host species for fritillary butterflies, like most violets are. And I believe they're mostly pollinated by bees. Another dainty little spring plant is the uh, blue-eyed Mary. This one mostly grows around central Missouri. Usually grows in light shade, really rich organic humusy soils. Uh, this one's actually a winter annual, so it only grows one year, 
uh, but it's also kind of weird in that it germinates in the fall, and then those tiny seedlings actually overwinter, and then kind of grow, become robust in the spring, flower, set seed, and then die. And they do look a little bit like violets, but instead of five flower parts, they, they have four, and uh, they have two colors. They're not just entirely blue, they're blue and white. And they can create somewhat large colonies by spreading via seed. Uh, sometimes they're used in gardens. Yeah, so shining blue star, uh, this particular species mostly grows in the Ozarks. Uh, it's often around gravel bars. Uh, it's a pretty tall perennial, uh, it almost looks woody sometimes. Forms these nice clumps. Uh, it has these attractive five petaled flowers. Uh, it's often ornamental. It's a really good species for rain gardens. It's often used uh, in those kinds of landscapings. And as I said before, it's usually found around gravel bars, so it tolerates some uh, early spring flooding in brief periods. Uh, it's pretty popular with pollinators, uh, not just bees, but uh, also zebra swallowtails. Pretty common species you see feeding on them. Uh, they're often pretty common around gravel bars as well. All right, so wild blue phlox. Uh, foxes in general are a pretty common ornamental species. Uh, this one is not too picky as far as habitat goes, but it generally it's more common and does best around moist stream banks, uh, richer soils, those kinds of areas. Five petaled flowers they have pretty Pretty deep flowers are kind of tubular. Uh, its leaves are actually evergreen. That's uh, pretty common in the woods. So most people who've walked around Missouri have probably seen this, whether or not they knew what it was. Uh, its leaves are actually evergreen, uh, and they do spread by rhizomes, and they make these nice little bouquet-like clumps. And because they're a very tubular flower, uh, they're mostly visited by long-thumbed pollinators, so larger bees, butterflies, hummingbirds, things like that. There's some intermixed with some buttercups, which often grow in the same areas. Uh, I think I said before, but yeah, they're often used in horticulture, uh, pretty good garden species. So summer bloomers, and keep in mind, many of these have a very long bloom period that will also extend into the fall as well. Uh, so one of the coolest plants is a uh, water willow. It's not actually a true willow. It's not a woody species. It's a uh, herbaceous plant in a totally unrelated, mostly tropical family of plants. Uh, it's kind of semi-aquatic, actually, which makes it different from all the other plants on this list. It's a couple of feet taller, so I think it gets the name water willow because its leaves are very long and lance shapes, like willows. It has a really cool, complicated flower structure. I'm not a botanist, so I don't entirely know what's going on there. It's usually kind of light purple, dark purple veins spotting. Uh, as I said before, they're kind of semi-aquatic. You usually find them growing along streams. Uh, even in streams, uh, be gravelly streams or muddy streams. Sometimes they grow on the edges of ponds or ditches in still water, but often they're growing in a flowing water, especially things like Ozark streams. Uh, so the size of the flowers are generally about an inch or so on these guys, uh, more or less. Uh, but yeah, they can actually grow in these Ozark streams. Uh, and they do that through their uh, rhizomes. Uh, they have a very extensive root system. We'll kind of talk about that in a minute. Uh, pretty popular with pollinators. If you've ever canoed along an Ozark stream and river, you've come across a stand of blooming water willow. Uh, they're usually covered in bees uh, and zebra swallowtails, giant swallowtails, things like that. Pretty good pollinator plant. There's a sulfur butterfly. And Sam, we did have a question in the chat on what size are the blooms on water willow? Yeah, I saw that. Uh, 
say about an inch or so. They're not too big. Maybe a little more than an inch. Uh, one of the ways that they're actually able to grow in these fast moving streams is they have a very extensive root system. Uh, so it penetrates deep, deep down into the gravel bed. And it spreads outward to form these huge colonies. Uh, so by doing that, it actually helps stabilize stream banks and stream beds themselves. You see they're kind of growing right in the middle of the stream channel. Uh, they're pretty important habitat for a lot of different species. So some fish will spawn in there. Uh, the fry will take shelter uh, amid all these aquatic plants. Uh, there's a lot of insects, aquatic insects or semi-aquatic insects that will use these habitats. Uh, amphibians like frogs will often hide in these habitats. Young snakes, baby turtles, really good shelter in these uh, high gradient streams that you find in the Ozarks, which generally don't have that much in the way of aquatic plants, just because there's so much momentum in that water, it's hard for things to get established, but uh, these ones do. So yeah, pretty cool plant in my opinion. Uh, not picky about where they grow. I've seen them growing almost right through the bedrock, too. So that's how serious their roots are. Like in this picture. Uh, there's no other aquatic plant that I could think of that can do that. It's just growing right through the rock. Right, spotted jewelweed. This is another pretty cool one. Uh, it's actually an annual species, so it only lives for a year. There's a pretty long bloom period. It starts early summer uh, through most of fall. Uh, like many annuals, it doesn't invest a whole lot in its tissues. Uh, so its stems are pretty brittle, very easily bent. It uh, has these kind of egg-shaped leaves with scalloped edges. Uh, but its flowers are definitely the most distinctive thing about it. They kind of look like the uh, cornucopias you'd find at Thanksgiving, or maybe some sort of horn or trumpet, something like that. <laughs> Pretty interesting. And in this species, they're generally orange with kind of a dark orange or red uh, lower lip. As far as habitat goes, they're always found uh, in close proximity to water. Uh, they are not drought tolerant at all. They need to keep the roots moist. So they're usually growing along streams or major rivers. Uh, they do actually do well in disturbed areas. They're pretty competitive. They can form pretty large colonies. Uh, so even really undisturbed, beat up uh, stream banks full of invasive species, you can still find uh, this species. Uh, yeah, it's very competitive. It's actually an invasive species in some parts of the Pacific Northwest. That's how competitive it is. Uh, an interesting fact about it is that its leaves are often used to uh, treat um, irritation or inflammation from things like poison ivy or stinging nettle uh, because its leaves actually contain um, something like an anti-inflammatory. Uh, it's convenient because they often grow in the same localities as the stinging nettles. They like those moist bottom one there is. As I said before, they can form pretty large colonies and they can grow several feet tall if they're in a good spot. Dense. Uh, and I was kind of restoring some riparian area at Shaw when I worked there. Um, it was just full of this invasive shrub. Uh, we just had to spray it out and the whole area died. We were kind of worried about it. We reseeded it with some native species. But then the next year it was just covered in jewelweed. And we didn't even put some jewelweed in the seed mix. But that's how well it does with disturbance. Just exploded after that. As far as pollinators go, hummingbirds are probably the most important. Um, it's also the, one of the most important flower species for hummingbirds. Uh, I've seen male hummingbirds guard huge patches of jewelweed from other hummingbirds, They're pretty territorial. Uh, so it's high quality real estate with them where these things are. Uh, but sometimes they are visited by insects as well. Uh, so large bees can reach the nectar that's in the back of that very tubular flower. And occasionally you get butterflies visiting them. Uh, I don't think I've seen that, but it does happen. Uh, their seeds are really cool. So uh, one of the other names for them is uh, touch me not. 
So when their seed pods are kind of ripe, uh, if you just raise them just a little bit, uh, the pod itself, the structure will just curl up really quickly and it'll actually just eject the seeds several feet. And that's how the species actually disperses. Uh, so when those seed pods get dry enough, uh, they'll just kind of burst open naturally and fling those seeds. But if you touch them, uh, they'll do the same thing. It's really cool to watch. I wish there was a video of it. You can kind of see how those would spiral backwards really quickly. It's almost like a crossbow. Now, there is another species of jewelweed that grows in Missouri. It's called pale jewelweed. Uh, it's virtually the same in every aspect, except it has much larger yellow flowers that are mostly pollinated by bumblebees instead of uh, hummingbirds. A tall bellflower. This is usually either a biennial or triennial. It's a very short-lived perennial species. It has a very long bloom period as well. Uh, it can get pretty tall. It's very stocky, about as tall as a person. And it'll grow flowers along most of the length of that stem. They're kind of cute little flowers. I think they almost look like little elephant trunks. It's like I said before, they're very tall, uh, narrow, stemmy flowers all along the length. And you can kind of see the, I think those are pistils, the female part of the flower kind of look like little elephants to me. So have a lot of different insect pollinators. Uh, nectar is pretty easily accessible by insects with short tongues like this little sweat bee, as well as things like butterflies. Another sweat bee. Sometimes people use it in garden settings. It's not the most formal looking, but uh, can do well in the backs of a garden. It does readily self-seed. Uh, there's a bunch of it along the Katy Trail around Columbia this year. That's where that picture's from. Right, so brown-eyed Susan. I'm sure you all have heard of black-eyed Susan. This is in the same genus, Rebecca. Uh, it's more of a... Uh, moist woodland species instead of kind of an open, drier, sunny dwelling species. Also has a really long bloom period, a pretty decent chunk of the growing season. Uh, as far as how it's different from black-eyed Susan in appearance, uh, it's much more leggy. Uh, it's very tall, has a lot of branching going on, and it's got tons and tons of these tiny flowers instead of a few larger flowers like black-eyed Susan. Uh, I think this plant probably had 100 flowers on it or so, something close. That's usually a short-lived perennial. But yeah, if you look at the flowers up close, they just look like little miniature black-eyed Susans. Uh, the actual flowers, the, the dark part, those are all tiny little florets, little individual flowers. So this is part of a family called the composites. They're called composites because each of their flower heads is made up of many, many, many tiny flowers. <clears throat> and the yellow parts is actually just the sepals, I think. So they have a lot of different pollinators because their flowers are pretty short. A lot of different insects can reach them. Uh, this is a hoverfly or a syrphid fly. It's a type of fly that mimics bees and wasps. They are pollinators. Yeah, as you can see, as I was talking about before, these things are just covered in little flowers often kind of ungainly looking, just stems all over the place. They often grow in lowland areas, but not always. Sometimes you can find them on the edges of woods, uh, stream banks, moist prairies sometimes. Not too picky. Uh, they do actually do well with disturbance, unlike some of these other plants. So this area, the Runge Nature Center, I think it gets mowed periodically. Uh, and they've responded to that really well. So like, most of this is all brown-eyed Susan. They do occur in more intact natural communities as well. And they produce a buttload of seed. I know when we were making our seed mixes at Shaw, uh, there was always quite a bit of this in it because uh, it was really easy to collect. It was everywhere. And it grows pretty well too. So garden flocks, that's also called summer flocks. Uh, it's the flocks, just like the blue flocks we talked about, that spring blooming one. But this one is taller and it blooms in the summer. Also has a really long bloom period. Uh, I, I have seen it growing or blooming in October. Uh, 
it's much taller than the blue phlox, it's four or five feet tall, uh, but it also has five petaled flowers. Generally within genera or families, uh, any given plant species, its flowers usually have the same number of petals. Uh, generally likes moist, rich soil, doesn't do well with drying out. It's often found around stream banks, no surprise. But it's generally not very common, you only find a few here or there. The very tubular flowers, just like most flocks. That's a pretty common garden species. Uh, so having tubular flowers, they're mostly pollinated by either hummingbirds or butterflies, which have long beaks, long proboscis that can actually reach the nectar at the back of the flower and successfully pollinate it. So the left is a, uh, some, probably a clear wing sphinx moth, which is a diurnal moth that uh, feeds on nectar. I think that's a carpenter bee on the right. And as I said before, it's a pretty common ornamental plant. There's a lot of different cultivars of this species that are grown, used in landscaping. Uh, they do pretty well. Uh, they are pretty attractive. They do well in formal settings. And their seeds are pretty cool too. Just like jewelweed, they, they kind of dry out and pop. Uh, but these ones, you can actually hear it. Uh, so we collected a, quite a bit of this at Shaw Nature Reserve from the uh, native plant garden. Uh, they were deadheading plants. We just put them all in big cardboard boxes and you had to cover them as these stems were drying out. Uh, because as those seed pods would dry out and mature, uh, they'd split and they'd shoot the seeds out. So if you didn't cover the box, the seeds would just get all over all over the place and you'd never be able to collect them. Uh, but we were putting them out in the sun to dry, covered with the box, and you could actually hear them popping every few seconds like popcorn, which is pretty cool. Their seeds are pretty big compared to the seed pod and other dark, kind of flat, disc-shaped. Right, cut leaf cone flowers. This is another Rudbeckia, just like the brown-eyed Susan, black-eyed Susan. Uh, it's often called golden glow. I think that's also a cultivar of it. Uh, has a pretty long blooming period. Uh, it's really, really tall. It's kind of a weedy species. Uh, can easily get eight or nine feet tall. Often growing alongside things like uh, giant ragweed. The most distinctive things about it are its leaves. Just like other rudbeckias, its flowers are yellow. It has a pretty uh, dense flower head made of those multiple little florets. Uh, it's often growing along streams or often in flood-prone river bottoms, uh, sometimes along bluebells or giant ragweed, things like that. It's often found in areas that get periodically flooded. You can really see in this picture like all those individual little florets in the flower head, and those are each their own flower, and they'll make a seed. And the leaves are one of the most distinctive things on this one. They're heavily lobed, serrated. Look vaguely like cannabis, maybe. Uh, they're pretty popular with pollinators, too. The nectar on these is pretty easy to reach, usually covered in bees. There's just sweat bees there. As I said before, they, they often grow in flood prone areas, uh, bottomland fields, uh, semi sunny, partly shaded uh, riparian forests. And uh, they can get pretty weedy as you can expect from something growing in rich soil that gets nine feet tall. Uh, so they can make these really large ranked stands, uh, which, I mean, if you're trying to establish native vegetation on a, a flood-prone area, uh, it's a pretty good species to pick. It's, it's pretty aggressive. You know it's going to establish well. And, and Sam, what part of the state are the cutleaf coneflower found? I believe they're found over most of the state. Most of these things have a pretty statewide distribution. Uh, some of the more forest dwelling species, they're generally absent from some far northwestern or northeastern counties. Uh, a lot of them aren't as prevalent in the bottomland areas in the boot heel in the southeast, just because it's an entirely different habitat. Uh, but most of these you can find statewide. Uh, so iron weeds, uh, it's, I just did genus for this one. There's a ton of species. They all look the same. They're a pain in the butt to identify. 
and they all hybridize anyway, so why bother? Uh, they get pretty tall too. Uh, they're called iron weeds because their stems are really tough and they'll stay standing uh, through the winter. Uh, some species are kind of a troublesome weed in cow pastures because cows don't like to eat them. So over time they can become pretty prevalent uh, in pastures. Their flowers, kind of like uh, the uh, Rudbeckias, they are a composite, they're in the same family. So each of their flowers is made up of multiple little florets. Uh, and these ones, they're very tubular. Uh, they're kind of a hot pink or purple color. Uh, their leaves are kind of just lance shaped, serrated. Uh, they're fairly distinctive, you know what you're looking for. Uh, they often grow in wet areas. There are some that prefer prairies or pastures, but many of the species, like I think Missouri, or at least giant ironweed, uh, they often grow in lowland forests or along stream banks, uh, places with lots of moisture. Uh, they're a very good pollinator species, so butterflies are all over them. Uh, they're often a really good bee species too, so uh, they make, they're good for uh, honey production of herd. They have pretty large fluffy seeds. Uh, you see on the left, those are the flowers kind of drying out, turning into these fluffy Tapas seeds, kind of cottony, they blow away in the wind, that's how they're dispersed. Uh, the actual seed is kind of under that fluff, it's fairly large, it's, I think it's a decent bird seed, I've seen birds feeding on these in the fall. Speaking of fall, uh, fall bloomers, although a lot of these kind of start in late summer, uh, their peak is generally early fall. Uh, one of the most beautiful Flowers in Missouri, as far as I'm concerned, is cardinal flower. Uh, just because there's really not many red flowers native to the state. It's probably one of like three. Uh, kind of medium in height, a couple feet tall, kind of a direct stem. Uh, these guys are moisture loving. Uh, they don't do well drying out. Uh, when they're blooming, you can spot them a mile away. There's only one other red flowered species that looks similar at all, but it's found in usually drier prairies and uplands, uh, royal catch fly. It's red and growing in a moist, wet area. It's probably a cardinal flower. Sometimes they grow in openings and woods. Uh, when they do, there's not a whole lot of light, so they're not quite as showy like this plant. Uh, often they're growing next to water, uh, whether it's stream banks or edges of ponds. Uh, sometimes wet prairies, uh, portions of wetlands. They can't put on quite a show. They do grow uh, along Ozark streams pretty common, commonly too. Saw a lot on the uh, Courtois River this summer. There's some growing, I think, probably in a bottomland prairie next to some uh, native hibiscus rose mallows. Anywhere where there's moisture. Uh, their main pollinator is uh, hummingbirds. It's not that surprising given their color. So a lot of insects can't actually see red. Uh, they can see ultraviolet, but they can't see the red part of the spectrum. Uh, whereas birds can actually see red and ultraviolet because I guess they're just cool that way. Uh, but yes, yeah, so if you see a red plant, it's probably more pollinated by either uh, birds or bats or something like that, as opposed to insects like bees. And obviously the long beak of the hummingbird fits in pretty well with the uh, tubular cardinal flower. Sometimes you see butterflies on them. Usually it's these uh, uh, sulfur butterflies, like clouded sulfur, so the big yellow ones. Uh, sometimes they're on there. They don't seem to be as picky as other butterflies. And it can be a pretty good garden plant if you have uh, rich soil and you can keep them moist. If they dry out, they're not going to do well. But if you have a naturally moist area that retains some water, or it's a low-lying area, uh, they can do pretty well. Very beautiful, uh, especially at the time of year when there's not a whole lot else blooming. So wing stem. This is another weedy one, kind of like the uh, cutleaf cone flower, and it looks pretty similar. Uh, it has a somewhat later bloom period, but it's also pretty tall. It's about as tall as a person or taller. Uh, yellow blooms, but the uh, flower heads are 
I'm not quite as compact as a cut leaf broom flower. Pretty erect, pretty tall. Uh, quite a few flowers on these ones. They're a little smaller than the uh, cut leaf cone flower flowers. Uh, they're called wing stems. Uh, their stems are pretty distinctive, so the edges are, have these fleshy ridges or wings that are really thin, running down the entire length of the stem, uh, kind of like a sail or a fin. Usually called wings in the botanical world. That's, that's how they get their name. Uh, they're usually growing uh, close to water, usually in wooded areas, so maybe uh, bottomland fields right at a forest edge or creek banks large rivers, those kinds of areas. Uh, they're always very popular with pollinators, uh, often because they're very abundant. Uh, they produce quite a lot of ne nectar. Uh, so butterflies, moths, flies, bees. Yeah, pretty good pollinator plant. Some weevils feeding on them next to a sweat bee. Might be feeding on pollen. Like I said before, they are pretty weedy. <clears throat> so like the cut leaf cone flower, they form these really large, thick, rank, tall stands uh, in the ideal habitats. Uh, but if you're trying to establish herbaceous native crown cover uh, in a suitable area, uh, it's a pretty good species to go with because you know it's, it's going to grow. Uh, it's going to be pretty aggressive. It competes well with invasive species. It's a pretty large end of it. It's kind of what the seed heads look like on the left. They're not quite ripe. Uh, on the right, they should be dry. They're ready to be picked and sown or eaten by birds and germinate in the next spring. Pretty large seeds. I, I would expect at least goldfinches would eat them. All right, mist flower. Uh, this is another composite. A pretty late bloom period. Uh, it's a very short plant. It's generally only about a foot tall or so. It's a perennial, uh, and it spreads pretty aggressively by rhizomes. Uh, as far as their habitat goes, they're really not that picky as long as there's moisture. I was pretty surprised to find these growing on a gravel bar. I didn't think they could, honestly. Uh, there were a lot growing along the stream bank and that finer soil, which you'd expect. Uh, they also grow in kind of wet depressions and prairies or fields, things like that. <laughs> sunny, somewhat open, moist woods. They are composite, so probably hard to see in that picture, but each one of those flower heads is made up of little tiny flowers. They're called mist flower because they kind of look like this little blue pink mist when you have a bunch of them growing next to each other. They're pretty attractive. Uh, they are an ornamental, but uh, they're pretty aggressive. So if you, if you use them in a garden, they have to have a lot of space. And I've seen this firsthand. They will grow and spread out uh, pretty rapidly. And again, these are pretty common with po pollinators as well, especially things like monarchs. Which they're migrating in the fall. Uh, fall blooming plants are important to them so they can get enough energy and fuel to make their migration south. The top right is a soldier beetle. It's probably feeding on pollen. Right, so great blue lobelia. So it's a lobelia, just like the cardinal flower. Same genus. Sometimes it's even called blue cardinal flower. Uh, blooms into October, sometimes early November if it stays warm. It's about the same size, a couple feet tall usually makes a couple tall stems with flowers all along them. Often grows in more shaded wooded areas than cardinal flower. But it also likes moisture. Find it along wooded streams or perennial streams, ephemeral streams, uh, intermittent streams. Sometimes it grows along ponds. It's pretty attractive. It's kind of a dark blue or purple color. Um, it's the flower structure, so they're a little deeper, uh, not deeper, but wider and shorter than cardinal flower. Sometimes they're white. It's pretty common for flowers 
um, random mutations. Sometimes they don't have any pigment. This one I found is Shawl. And there's a blue lobelia at the bottom growing next to a cardinal flower at the top. If you look at their flower structures, they're pretty much the same. See those two uh, petals or two lips at the top and the three on the bottom. Uh, the only difference is the color and kind of the depth. And that's because they're catering to their main pollinator, which is bumblebees. Uh, so they're shorter so the bumblebees can reach that nectar and the pollen. Uh, and they're blue so the bumblebees can actually see the color so they can't see red. And they're pretty good ornamental. I don't think their moisture needs are quite as high as cardinal flower, but uh, if you have any uh, rich low-lying area that doesn't get too dry, uh, they're a good species for yards or rain gardens. Uh, they get the name syphilitica, their species name, because they were actually thought to be a cure for syphilis. Uh, so Europeans were actually importing them from America or exporting them from the Americas into Europe uh, as a treatment for that and it's been used for other diseases as well. Uh, it is mildly poisonous, actually. If you eat it. Uh, so that's it for flowers. But I think I would be remiss if I didn't at least mention some of the grasses since they are a pretty important uh, component of these ecosystems. Uh, I'm just going to gloss over them. Uh, one of the most uh, abundant is often river oats, which is a cool season grass, grows in woodlands, uh, sometimes called creek oats. Uh, it has these big distinctive seed heads. It's really easy to collect when you get a good stand of it. You can fill a bucket in an hour. Uh, it germinates really well. It's really good for uh, establishing ground covers in low lying areas that are lacking understory vegetation or have been disturbed recently. Uh, so it's often used in restoration projects. Uh, there's a lot of different native rye, uh, many of which grow in riparian areas like uh, Virginia wild rye, early rye. Uh, they're related to the cultivated kinds of rye, but they are native. Uh, often, again, used for restoration projects because they germinate pretty well. And then there's switchgrass, which is really more of a prairie grass. It's warm season bunch grass. Uh, can grow in dry areas, often grows in low lying areas in open prairies, things like that. Uh, so you do find it growing along streams uh, in the open. And often it's used, it's planted uh, in some uh, bank stabilization projects or establishing, reestablishing herbaceous vegetation along uh, some streams, especially in agricultural areas like northern Missouri. And they have a really deep, extensive root system. It's several feet deep. Uh, so, you know, these kinds of plants are more than capable of uh, stabilizing stream banks uh, along small streams that are really slow moving. They don't have a whole lot of velocity, so uh, they hold their own. And they're often planted in these kind of like buffer strips, uh, kind of between crop fields and riparian areas and uh, riparian forests, uh, mainly to help uh, kind of stop runoff. So they're absorbing that water that's running off of the crop fields. They're taking in those excess nutrients from fertilizers, uh, things like that preventing uh, erosion in those areas. Uh, pretty good species for, for reclamation. Uh, and then river cane, uh, sometimes it's called switch cane. Uh, it's actually a native bamboo. Uh, it's the only genus of bamboo that's native to the Americas. Interestingly enough, uh, it's the only bamboo native to Missouri. Uh, this used to be a pretty extensive habitat called the cane breaks uh, in the Southeast United States. Uh, it's pretty much gone now. It's kind of an endangered habitat, really. Uh, there used to be huge swaths in the understories of these bottomland forests that were just full of this bamboo. Uh, and it was a great habitat for songbirds and swamp rabbits and deer, uh, rattlesnakes. Uh, There's actually a warbler, I think, that went extinct in part due to the lack of this habitat, uh, just due to draining of bottomlands and deforestation and overgrazing. Uh, it disappeared. You do find it uh, in the Ozarks, kind of along lower reaches of Ozark streams where the floodplain's a little wider. It's kind of the northern extent of its distribution. It used to be much more common in the boot heel and the rest of the southeast, the deep south, but uh, it's much rarer nowadays. So as far as trying to restore herbaceous cover, and we've kind of talked about why it's good to have these kinds of plants in an ecosystem. 
uh, as far as getting them back on the landscape. Uh, some ways to do that, uh, say if there's heavy grazing going on, so just limiting access to these areas, reducing the grazing pressure, sometimes enough to let them regenerate. Um, same thing with mowing. Some people will mow right next to a stream or pond bank. Uh, if you stop that, sometimes native vegetation will just take right back up again. Uh, often nowadays, there's a lot of invasive vegetation. Uh, so this is honeysuckle, bush honeysuckle growing along a stream. There's no understory in this area anymore. It's all been outcompeted. Uh, and I'll talk about that in detail in the last presentation. Uh, so removing these kinds of invasive species uh, would be important if you did want to actually reestablish uh, native vegetation, because it just it won't it won't deal with all that invasive competition. Uh, so after removing that invasive vegetation or stopping whatever disturbance is going on, uh, it often helps to plant or sow native plants, usually seed in these areas, to kind of get a head start. Uh, increase the actual diversity in that area. Uh, so many many native species are commercially available. Uh, you can also hand collect them too, which is free, obviously. Uh, that's what these volunteers are doing at Shaw Nature Reserve. They're hand collecting native seeds to be put in a seed mix, uh, which is then uh, designed uh, for a specific area or habitat. So we make upland seed mixes or bottomland seed mixes prairie versus woodland, things like that. Uh, so if you actually learn your plants and you know what they look like as seeds and seed pods, which can be a completely different process because they look totally different, uh, you can collect things on your own and sow them out into certain areas if you know what you're collecting and the kinds of habitats that they grow in. Generally, grass species are cheaper to buy in large quantities and they're also easier to collect. Uh, so with a group like this, you could collect like a, a garbage bag or a trash can full of some grass species in a couple hours. Uh, most wildflower species, their seeds aren't that big and they're generally not as abundant. So grass species, like some of the ones I talked about, are often heavily used in restoration projects, but generally should sprinkle at least some wildflower seeds in there for a diversity. Native seed looks like. Uh, comes in all shapes and sizes. There's fluffy seed. There's seeds that are smaller than grains of sand, like cardinal flower and blue lobelia. They have tiny seeds. If you exhale too much, they'll just blow away. Uh, so if you want to actually sow seeds, whether you buy them or collect them yourself, uh, the best time to do that for most natives is either now into February. And that's because most of them require some sort of uh, exposure to cold temperatures before they'll actually germinate. And that's just to keep them from germinating in the fall and then being killed by winter frosts. It's kind of an adaptation there. Uh, some of the grasses you can sow in early spring and they'll germinate just fine without that exposure. And as I said before, uh, actually sowing species uh, backed in an area that helps increase the plant diversity and the pollinator habitat. Because uh, a lot of areas have really just been uh, heavily degraded over the last century, and they don't have the species diversity that they would. Uh, but it's hard for a lot of people to really see what plants are there. Uh, it's a completely other hurdle above that to see what plants are not there that should be. Um, yeah, sowing sowing native seeds really really helps, and that's what these volunteers are doing uh, with the seed mix we made for that area. Uh, tend to establish pretty quickly. So, say, like a tree planting, it's going to be decades before those are mature trees. Uh, they're baseous stuff. Usually, they germinate by the first year. They're pretty small. By the second year, they're a little larger. You might see some flowers. And by the third year, uh, everything's pretty well established. Relatively quick. Uh, you can see in this area, in the prairie region of Missouri, they're trying to restore the uh, stream bank and stream channel of this kind of small prairie stream, uh, low gradient, not a whole lot of velocity. Uh, so instead of using a bunch of trees, uh, they actually used a lot of herbaceous vegetations and small shrubs. Uh, and that pretty much did the job there. Uh, same thing here. This was a restoration project in Springfield along South Creek. Uh, so this used to be just a concrete ditch. So they turned the creek into just a concrete 
channel straight. Uh, they tore all the concrete out. Uh, they planted and sowed a bunch of native things, grasses, bulrushes, sedges, wildflowers uh, to help reestablish native vegetation and hold that stream bank together. Uh, they didn't want to put a bunch of trees in because they wanted it to be uh, visible to the public because there's a bike trail that runs along it. Uh, but yeah, these herbaceous things were able to do the job just, just fine. There's another bad picture from a different angle. Lots of bulrushes and stuff growing along the water. There were a lot of wildflowers in this area that they had sown. As far as removing invasives, uh, this is a picture from Shaw Nature Reserve. So it's Brush Creek in the uh, Merrimack drainage. Uh, in this picture, the entire length of this creek was just infested with this invasive shrub called uh, privet. There was a lot of honeysuckle in there too. So we wanted to restore this area and it was a volunteer's pet project. Uh, so we went in that winter and through spring, uh, we were clearing all of it uh, by hand, cutting it, treating it with herbicide, uh, getting rid of all those invasive shrubs. Uh, and then we sowed it with native seed. And that's what it looked like the next growing season. It's mostly free of invasive shrubs, but there's a lot of wildflowers and grasses and stuff uh, growing in their place. Uh, it's the same picture from a different angle, a bunch of invasive privet, uh, not a whole lot else able to grow in this area just because it's competing so well. Uh, removed all that. I wish it took that long, but it took several weeks, many, many hours, many volunteers. Uh, we sowed it seed and it looked like that the next year. Uh, very lush, lush and open. So, as I said before, a lot of these are also good for landscaping, formal settings. Uh, a lot of the species I mentioned are good for things like rain gardens, uh, bio retention controls. See, picture in the top, that's uh, kind of a rain garden or bio retention area to soak up water coming off a parking lot. Uh, it's probably switchgrass, it's a good species for that. Uh, just good ornamentals in general, a lot of them are around your house, uh, they attract pollinators. Uh, soak up runoff, things like that. Uh, so you can incorporate a little bit of nature in your own yard uh, using some of these species, things like blue star is really good, switchgrass is really good, uh, any of the phloxes, bluebells, cardinal flowers. Uh, some of them aren't as formal looking, but they're good for restoration purposes. That's all I got, eight o'clock. <laughs>